guys, and welcome back for another episode of the Social Hour Podcast, a podcast for SOAS by SOAS. I'm your host, Ashley. And I'm your host, Bethany. And on today's episode, we are talking all about interfacing and stabilizer Mm -hmm. and that they are different. I didn't know this. (laughs) <laughs> I'm bad. I'm a bad sewist. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. We're we're going to be learning and educating <laughs> as ourselves. I ourselves. Um, I I love working with interfacing and stabilizer. So I'm we're going to kind of get nerdy about it. But I think it's important because both of these are very important materials to help with your sewing projects. So we're going to take a deep dive. But before we do, Ashley, mm-hmm. what you been doing? Oh man. <laughs> working on patterns, working on the yeah. farmhouse chic skirt. It's so good. Yeah. It's so cute. If you have not made her farmhouse chic skirt pattern from Copper Creek Patterns that she released, it is so stinking cute. It's like the perfect springtime skirt. It is, right? And Easter I love coming it. up. Like I know. Yeah. I know. I love it. I um I made it and I wore it on HSN recently, which you didn't know I was going to do that. I just took it as like a a backup outfit, but then it ended up being my number one outfit. And I, it was so cute. It was, I love a lot of compliments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love it. It's super, I'm not usually a skirt person either. I don't know why, because it was adorable on you. Thank you. I just, I'm, I, I think it's because it kind of cuts me. Like this one sits a little higher, so it's easier. It's better. I think in the past skirts just hit lower, and it. I just mm. I'm, I don't have a curve. I am built like a square, and um, and I don't like have hips, and I don't have like curves. There's not like a huge difference between like my you know upper like my upper bust, my waist, and my hip. Like there's not a huge. I am not an hourglass. Yeah, I'm a bean pole. So. <laughs> It's a little well, different. There's the A line. It has a little bit of A line to it, so it kind of gave it, you hip. It, it, it kind of gave me the hip fullness with like the the pleats and the gathers and mm. the elastic. So it worked. And then I made sure I wore a shirt that kind of gather yeah. tied at the waist, right in front mm. of the skirt. That shirt normally isn't meant for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it normally is just a button down that I would tuck in. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to try tying this. I think it would be cute. And it actually kind of gave me more of like a point at the waist different. And it worked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to, I've learned thanks to sewing and patterns. I've learned how to manipulate things yeah. to work for my body. So mm-hmm. I'm opening my mind to skirts. And it's funny because I did a skirt for my first pattern. But I paired that with a very fitted bodysuit, so it, it worked. Yeah. So I tried. Well, there were several people that paired it with, um, like, a oversized sweater. Yeah. And it was so suits. cute on them. And I put it on there, and I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wait. I can't. I can't pull it off, and I wish I could. It just. I, I get lost in it. I thought it was really cute. I would. I made it out of. Um, some linen so it was very like farmhouse um and then i i I wear mine like at the at the waist and you were using like a really high waist yeah and and that actually helps to make me not like it just i don't know it helps my shape because i do have kind of an hourglass i think sort of Mm -hmm. or I don't know what shape, what fruit I am, but, um, <laughs> but I wore like a tight, uh, fitted, uh, what do you mm-hmm. call it? Tank top. And then I put like a sweater over top yeah. with, my, my, with my skirt and it actually like looked really, really good. I it's thought so cute, but that's not some, a typical way I would wear a skirt because I didn't really think about my body and what would look better. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm like, okay, well now that I'm learning to dress for the shape of my body, I'm going to be wearing the skirt more often and buy more linen because it is absolutely divine. <laughs> I know. I so the linen, I had like a linen blend um, mm-hmm. and it was from Hobby Lobby and actually Brock picked it out. He picked it out and then like that next day I cut mm-hmm. it and made it. And then the next day I flew to Tampa to go to HSN. So, you know, you know me last minute. Classic. 
Yes. I mean, it was late night, but I got it done and um, it turned out super cute. And I paired it with little white sneakers, like little yeah, white heads. So cute. Yeah. And so it kind of like made it casual. But I did that because last time I, I was on HS and I wore heels with that leopard A-line or um, bias cut skirt. Right. And oh my gosh, my feet were killing me. And I was only on air for like 20 minutes. And this time mm -hmm. I had two one hour segments. So I was like, I am not wearing heels. Yep. For sure. And a lot of the hosts there are like petite mm. and I already tower over them. Um, and so I was like, I think I'm going to not wear yeah. heels. And I yeah, wore yeah, tennis yeah. shoes and it was perfect because what if those who watched um, this recent airing on HSN, I, what you don't realize is I was actually running between two studios during the second. Yeah. Run. You can't tell. You don't know yeah. that. Yeah. I was like running across the hall, <laughs> taking a swig of water, fixing my hair like a different totally different space yeah interesting it was it oh. was across it was like across the way but you have to walk around oh. the whole studio go across and then walk into that one around all the cameras and stuff it was it was because our tables were so big yeah I and know. they, want, they didn't want to have to take them out and then bring them back in again so they just left them in the other studio that wasn't being used that day mm -hmm. and it was just it stayed set up so why were the tables so big? What were on the tables? Um, Singer's new Momento cutting machine that's 24 what? inches wide. I know. <laughs> it's so cool, y'all. And I feel like we're actually now we're talking before we hit record today. And we were like, we I feel like we should do a whole oh, yeah. a whole podcast on cutting machines. So we're going to gather that information and in the near future have a conversation about them. But mm -hmm. if you haven't heard... Singer just launched a brand new cutting machine called the Singer Memento. It is a 24 inch wide cutting machine. It is beautiful. I just launched it on HSN um, live TV um, mm -hmm. and it's exclusively only available through HSN until the end of March. And then it'll be available over on singer.com. Um, but other accessories are currently available on singer.com. So you can yes. go get the machine at HSN and then you can go to singer.com and get all the other mats. Cause we could only sell certain things on HSN yes. for the launch. But we have like bigger mats and heat presses and tools for weeding and brayers. And we have a brayer that's like huge. It's so good. Mm -hmm. um, we cool. have all sorts of things. One. Yeah. So it, it's we didn't just launch a cutting machine. No. We launched a whole crafting category of products that we've never done before. Like we didn't just like stick our toe in the crafting world. We jumped in head first. Well, we've I been working on this for years. <laughs> I had someone message me and be like, where's the 24 inch by 24 inch mat? I'm waiting for her to bring out the 24 by, I'm like, she can't talk about it. I can't talk about it because it wasn't being sold through HSN. And the right. reason is, is because whatever we bundle together on HSN, fun fact, you guys wouldn't know this. Anytime we bundle extra feet with a machine or whatever, we it has to fit in the box with the product right. the main product so mm -hmm. the 12 by 24 inch mats we couldn't fit into the box with the memento no. because and if we tried to squeeze them in there they would have gotten bent and then they would have not worked well for right. you so we didn't so those ship in their own box flat so that they come to you in the best condition mm -hmm. so the 24 by 24 inch ones so the ones that fit in the box are the 12 by 24 inch and that the standard grip comes with the machine to always but for hsn only we added the fabric one so mm -hmm. the 12 by 24 inch fabric mat we also sell 12 by 12 mats too so you can get smaller mats too oh. you can get the bigger mats it's totally Same. up to you but um, we had to put mats that would fit in the box without getting damaged. So it really was because we didn't want you guys to receive something that wasn't going to be in good working condition. So the 24 by 24 inch mats. And I mentioned it, but yeah. I couldn't show them. They went the markers. You were like, there are more. And then you stopped. And I was like, more what? <laughs> more markers. We've got um, a whole kit. We'll, we'll do a whole episode on this, but we do have a whole kit of markers. We do have gel pens. Um, I'm telling mm. you, you need to go over singer.com and see all of it. So just, um, oh shoot. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was going to say one more thing about it. Mm. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Um, it happens to the best of us. <clears throat> Don't you hate it's that? Okay. You know, it'll come to you in a minute while we're mid-conversation about interfacing, and we'll just shift gears. 
Yeah. That's on brand for us, so. That's okay. Oh, I'm you're sure. so disappointed and bugged. It's it's annoying me. The like, look what? on your face. It was about the memento and oh well, I would hope yeah. so. I got it, I got it. Woo! Um <laughs> it is will they come out with a product bundle? Is that a thing? Um, so when we ship from singer.com, we can ship you multiple boxes. Mm -hmm. So we can bundle more things. Whereas like, HSN, if we, if they ship stuff, all the bundle pieces have to fit in one box. So that's why right, we're right. kind of limited as to like what we've been like the feet that I sold, the extra feet that came with the machine, um, on HSN that we were selling those fit into the box. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is like, those have to be pre-boxed like they when we do bundles like that on hsn they go through and open the box add those accessories in and then have to reseal the box for mm. all of them mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them so, a person so it's does that oh man people yeah. in a warehouse do that yeah. yeah it's a lot it's a lot of work yeah. so uh -huh. there's a reason why we kind of are limited to what we yeah. can do but like with um, the with the you were selling the the heavy duty and then you were selling like secondary to that was the tote the travel tote the travel so tote. I'm like wondering if there is just sold uh, separately they are not a part of the bundle so they actually ship in their own box yeah so I'm just like is there going to be a time where they have the memento and then secondary to that here is a, a bundle with. Um, they may in the future, um, but yeah. that bundle of accessories would also have to be re repackaged into one box. All right. Mm -hmm. And they may in the future. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. We're going to have to get creative um, with some of that. So we'll see. I mean, it's just, it's really cool to kind of see the behind the scenes. If you're not following me on Instagram, Craft with Bethany, I've shared like my, all my travels to HSN and behind the scenes and all of that mm, in my Instagram stories this year uh, yeah <laughs> you're I'm, home i'm going again in like what a couple weeks and then i go Twenty again a week after that so yeah and then you're gonna go again it. in april but for other no things. i'm not going in april you're going to tampa for other things oh but i'm going on a girl's trip to tampa <laughs> yeah. and then i might be going back to tampa in may tampa's oh, wow. quickly becoming my second home uh, yeah exactly I know I'm going to be back on HSN in July, mm. right after the 4th of July, and I'm thinking about taking Brock on that one. Because mm. we normally do like a birthday trip for him, mm -hmm. and his birthday is at the end of July, and um, I just thought, hey. Yeah, why not? If, I'm, if I can just extend my trip and you come with me, yeah, um, why not? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. anyways, uh, right. before... Before we dive in too much further into our topic, um, I want to remind everybody that at the end of the episode, we will be having our sewing confessions. And let me tell you, the one we have today <laughs> is spicy. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is a spicy one. <sighs> so stay tuned for that at the end of our episode. You'll be hearing all about that. But if you, too, have a sewing confession, be sure to click the link in our description or go to our website and uh, submit your anonymous sewing mm -hmm. confession. We don't know who these people are. And today's is a good reminder as to why we make it anonymous. All right, guys, <laughs> let's dive into stabilizers and interfacing. Ashley, do you know the difference between interfacing and stabilizer? Uh, I sure do. <laughs> Because we just thought Why about wouldn't it. I not know the difference between Did the you two. know before today? Well, that's another story. <laughs> it's okay. That's another podcast. That's a, these are my confessions. Yeah. These are Ashley's confessions. Um, oh, okay, so I think we should start with the kind of the definition of interfacing and stabilizer. Yeah. I'll let you do the interfacing one. You want to read off? We're going to read the actual definition of these materials before we dive in. 
see the reason why I know interfacing is because I use it primarily, but and uh, I know stabilizer primarily. So exactly, we make a good team, don't we? Right, it's like the yin and the yang, right? You're the Uh the garment, and I'm the the bags. But anyways, yeah. So sewing interfacing is material material used in sewing projects to add structure, stability, and support to fabric. It's typically um, a thin layer of fabric often non-woven or woven that is placed between layers of main fabric piece during construction but it's not also that's something that i think you could Mm -hmm. use back in the olden days to be able to add structure but now we got like a slew and yeah Yeah. just just we're gonna we're gonna go over them but Mm -hmm. um like it (laughs) usables and wovens and all kinds of and they're they're it's an interfacing product it's not like just use thicker fabric Mm -hmm. um anyways it was used to um reinforce things like collars and cuffs and waistbands and buttonholes but we use it a lot in bag making to make structure to create Mm -hmm. you know the shape of the bags and stuff um and then it also prevents your fabrics and stuff from distorting or stretching which is a huge thing especially if you're just like i want to use this fabric but it stretches and i want to stop it from stretching yeah um and it comes in various weights and types to suit different fabrics and projects so we will talk all about that but that's basically what sewing interfacing is yes so it's a permanent addition yes permanent addition like it doesn't leave the project Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. either fused or sewn in it stays there it's between layers of material or you know like you said in a cuff yeah um or a collar um so it stays um -hmm. whereas sewing stabilizer is a material used to provide support structure and reinforcement to fabric during the sewing process Mm -hmm. it is typically a temporary layer that is placed underneath or on top of the fabric being sewn to prevent stretching, distortion, and puckering. Stabilizers can be made of various materials, such as paper, fabric, and adhesive back materials. They come in different forms, including so many that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Stabilizers are commonly used when working with delicate or stretchy fabrics, intricate embroidery designs, or when sewing seams that require extra support. They mm-hmm. help improve the quality and appearance of the finished sewing project. So again, it's a temporary hold during the construction or sewing process that's usually removed in some method of um, cutaway, tear away, or wash away. Mm-hmm. So that's the two differences. I think a lot of people get them mixed up and rightfully so, because when you look at them, right, it's just all white stuff, right? <laughs> like <laughs> there are some other colors of like, interfacing and stabilizers that you can get i know stabilizers can come in like a black or like a mesh and there's some other things but both have fusible both have sewn in um but the difference is interfacing stays stabilizer leaves mm-hmm. okay so if you remember nothing today when you're looking at that like shelf of all the interfacings and stabilizers and on, on the bolts and all these different ones start to run together interfacing stays stabilizer leaves mm-hmm. okay leaves the project okay so ashley i'm going to ask you what would you say is some of the most common reasons that you've used interfacing um the most common reasons i use interfacing is to create structure for bags yeah definitely for bags um there's there's just so many different types of interfacing these days for bags they have Really, Mm -hmm. the technology has and and just blown up when it comes to that, and it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. So let's let's take a minute to like. I'm just going to quickly read through some of the most commonly used interfacings. There are um, way more than this. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can get real specific with, like you said, weight, thickness, types, those kind of things. But we're just going to kind of brush the surface and then you can kind of go, okay, I know I need something that will do this. And then you can kind of take that and dive into like the different types of that. So um, I would say one of the most common is fusible interfacing. Mm-hmm. And obviously this can come in so many different weights. I mean, it can come in something very thin for tailoring, for supporting buttonholes or a waistband or a collar or a cuff, but it can also come in really thick and be fusible for like bags and stuff. So 
fusible is a very loose term in the sense of the interfacing actually fuses with your iron to the material. There's like a smooth side and a bumpy side, and that bumpy side is the glue. And you want to put that to the wrong side of your material and fuse it. Mm -hmm. um, then there's non-fusible interfacing. Um, you, people do still use this, especially if they're going to put it in between layers and maybe um, uh, stitch over it, quilt over it. It's okay if it's um, non-fusible. Yeah. You kind of need to secure that into place by doing like yes. a stitch around or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a situation where you want to remove the interfacing before mm -hmm. washing. Mm -hmm. And then that would be a situation where you would want to use a non-fusible. Mm -hmm. Woven interfacing um, is typically, you know, provides stability without adding much bulk. So this is probably going to be more commonly used for garments. There's knit interfacing. Um, there's tricot interfacing, which is like a lightweight, fusible, commonly used with very lightweight fabrics where you want it to be almost undetectable. Mm -hmm. Sheer interfacing, same thing. You want um, you want it to be very lightweight, but you still want the fabric to have its drape. So if you're doing like a satin, but you need to interface something yeah, and you need it to still lay like satin and not look stiff, this is that situation. Mm -hmm. There's um, stretch interfacing. Um, and then there's also water soluble interfacing. Water soluble is really fun because it's, it's an interfacing. This is the oddball out. It's an interfacing, but it's temporary. Mm. So it kind of is a mix between interfacing and stabilizer. Yeah, it is. I wouldn't say that it's very commonly used in a lot of things because you want that stabilizer to stay in place. Mm -hmm. But I guess I could see, or the interfacing to stay in place. But so to me, this water soluble interfacing is kind of like trying to be a stabilizer. Yeah. <laughs> so, because it, it's a temporary. And it dissolves in water. And there's water soluble stabilizer. Yeah. Anyways. So those are the different types of interfacing. Um I I have started to dabble into the quilt like the the foam. Yeah. The mm -hmm. foam interfacing like and using foam. that for bags and quilting it. And yeah. I freaking love it. I know you can take like your leather and make it into a quilted leather pattern or you can use or just quilting cotton into like a really nice bag because you're adding that foam mm -hmm. to really thicken it up and give it structure. Yeah. I just purchased some. They have it from Pellon called Flex Foam. It's like what? A quarter of an inch thick. It's thick. Yeah. And it's like it just will add like if you're going to make like a, a bowler bag or something and you want it to be like sit on your table structure beautifully and you would use that and it would just mm -hmm. oh it's so nice mm -hmm. yeah. now there's some that i've used before that are fusible but they also come non-fusible um when i made the lens handmade h2o to go sling and it mm -hmm. has to support my giant water 40 ounce water cup with water in it it was like so heavy um there were um I don't know how, what it what it was, but it was thick. Peltex. It was Peltex. Yeah, and it was thick, and we cut circles, and yeah. I think I had two circles of that in the bottom. That's definitely something that people like to use for the bottom of. You know, if like some mm -hmm. people will put like a piece of cardboard or something like. No, no, you get Peltex and you cut it, and it has fusible, but I'm find that the fusible doesn't work really well because it's mm -hmm. so thick that the iron can't penetrate the layers. So it's really something that, you know, I just kind of either tape in with double-sided tape or I sew it in. Um, but it'll make that bottom of your bag like a square or a rectangle, how mm -hmm. you want it to be. Or a circle for like my sling. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've, it is thick. It is stiff. And what's great, and you mentioned the cardboard thing. We've mm -hmm. seen pattern companies who aren't really bag making companies release a bag and they're like oh just stick some cardboard in the bottom to keep it supportive or you know stick some plastic in there and i'm like but that's or... but but you're sewing it in and what if i ever want to wash that duffel bag yeah you can't my cardboard will dissolve yeah so and if you put plastic in there like it could the sharp nope. edges could also like poke holes in the fabric over time mm -hmm. so peltex really is the only because these interfaces Interfaces, while they are a permanent addition to the material of the project, they're washable. Yeah. 
Exactly. That's why they're so important because you may want to wash that bag. You may want to wash that garment. I hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. So I feel like uh, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's so many different ones. If you're not sure, they sell it like you can off the bolt and you can just yeah. go get a little bit and play around with it, like sample it. It's not super expensive, right? Mm-hmm. No, well, maybe I mean, and it's always on sale, so don't it ever is. buy it at regular price because no, I will say Joann's is when I typically when they run their they'll run their interfacing and stabilizers like sixty percent off, mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. when I'll go and get a couple of yards, and that'll last me a long time because a lot of projects when it, we'll use your skirt for example, Ashley, your farmhouse chic skirt, you had the waistband interfaced and you had the button placket interfaced, mm -hmm. and um. And that that's just two small strips mm -hmm. out of this whole skirt. Like, you don't use a lot. No. So I feel like a little goes a long way, and you don't need to buy a ton of it, and it'll last you a long time. And I, here's the other thing. This is where I like fusible interfacing and fusible stabilizer, but really fusible interfacing, is I cut a strip, and then um, I ended up needing more. Mm -hmm. My strip wasn't long enough. And so I just cut another piece and just added it to the bottom because it's fusible. It just was seamless. It doesn't yeah. have to be one consistent strip. You can kind of like when it's fusible, you can kind of patchwork it together. I have done that so many times. And I, it's just like with interfacing, like you use it up. Like you don't yeah. just like, oh, I have, you know, like your fabric where you're like, I'll never use it. Like, no, no, no. You keep every single scrap of your interfacing because exactly you oh, can yeah. just piece it all together. Um, and it's also okay so let's talk real quick there's like an oddball out in this that wasn't mentioned on that list and it's called heat and bond oh mm -hmm. and heat and bond is a double-sided fusible yes interfacing because mm -hmm. it's a permanent so let's say you um had a square of quilting cotton and you would attach, you could attach, um, you could fuse one side of the heat and bond to that quilting cotton. Mm -hmm. And then you could draw on the paper backing, like whatever shape, let's say it's a heart, for example. So we're going to draw a heart on the paper backing of the heat and bond and cut that out. Mm -hmm. And then I can remove that paper backing. So now my heart fabric has got this shiny side on the back. And that's the fusible. So when I go and flip that over and put it, the shiny side down onto the right side of my skirt, for example, and I can press that onto my skirt and it fuses that heart to my skirt. And then I can go with a satin stitch or a little fun decorative stitch and stitch all the way around that heart to permanently secure it. But that heat and bond prevents that material, that heart from shifting while you're sewing. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's the applique process. That's the applique process. So um, I feel like it's worth mentioning that there is a material called heat and bond. Mm -hmm, it's a right double-sided fusible. You fuse one side, you cut out your shape, you fuse the other side. And this is where these cutting machines can come in, especially if they cut fabric really well, where you can fuse your material with the heat and bond, and then you can cut out your shape with the cutting machine and then you remove the shape and you're ready. You could do letters. You could do some very intricate things that it would be really hard to cut out by hand. Yeah, for sure. That's, so, that's how I did my um, applique for the mm -hmm. kids shirts before I had a cutting machine. Even then I would take, um, I would go on my computer and I would print out letters and then I would trace, trace it. Yeah. Yeah. Onto the back. And then I would and then have to them. hand cut them. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it was pretty good for not having like, a cutting machine, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. my mom, one of my favorite things that my mom made me when I was little was a beach towel with my name on it because nothing has my name on it. No, no, no. Nothing. Everything and has my name on it. Everything has Ashley's name on it. <laughs> That's all they carry. The keychains all just say Ashley because there's so many Ashleys. There's so many. There's never a Bethany. There's just a Beth. And I'm oh. like, nope. No, n nothing against the Beths out there, but my name's not Elizabeth. Um, and so I go by Bethany. And so I never had anything with my name on it. So my mom made a beach towel with appliqued my name in these big letters all the way across the bottom. And then it had like three different sunglasses in three different colors. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my beach. Towel. I still to this day have that beach towel. I was like six when she made it for me. Yeah. 
I still have it. The towel is in horrible shape, but that applique looks beautiful still because she used the right heat and bond. She used the, you also need some stabilizers for stitching that on. So, you know, you do it right. It can last longer than the product you're stitching it onto. <laughs> mm. But no, it's great. And, but she did it all by hand too. So, all right. So do we feel comfortable with interfacing? No. Um, I okay. think we can talk about Decaville because oh. that's something that's kind of slightly new. Have you ever heard of Decaville before? I've heard of the name, but I'm not familiar with the use off the top of my head. So enlighten me. Decaville is sort of like a leathery type of interfacing. It kind of feels like leather when you touch it. It's different. Um, they have light, medium, and heavy, and they use it typically for bags. Um, I like to have Decoville for like my bag flaps. Like if you have like a flap or something, I'll use Peltex for that as well. Um, but if you really want that like thick and it just fuses to the fat, it's just, it's beautiful. It's not like Peltex. If you try to fuse Peltex, it doesn't. But this Decoville like melts literally mm. into the fabric. It's so lovely and expensive. <laughs> expensive yeah the new yeah. stuff usually is too that's really never, cool if you never tried it and that you are getting into bag making you definitely need to um yeah get some because it's very popular and, and easy to use oh my god yeah okay and you can draw you on it that. And, and to like make your shapes and stuff oh really yeah it's it's very interesting it's not what you would at all think of like a typical and it's kind of it's tan or beige so it's not huh. even white it's just i don't know i love it it's great <laughs> i'm gonna go google that here in a minute and look at i need you know i'm a visual person sometimes you just need to look at it especially if it's different than all the other ones that are yeah. typically it's white from palon palon makes okay it um, i know we've talked about the name i don't know that i've ever like sought it out but then again, I feel like I might have some. Is that weird? You never know. <laughs> uh, I, you wouldn't, I th it wouldn't surprise you, would it? No, of course not. I mean, I, that happens to me all the time. I think it comes in heavy and light, actually, only. Um, But I've never actually used the heavy, but the light. I mean, I use that for, like, when I made those necessary clutch wallets, I use that for the flap. Mm. Um, and it's wonderful. So let's talk about mixing and mixing interfacing. Yeah. Sounds like you do that a lot. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like if you were to make a bag, I typically work with medium weight interfacing for my cotton pieces. Um, for structures, um, Flex Foam and Decaville or Peltex. That is, I mean, you just have to have everything for it because it all kind of does something different, you know, in the bag. Um, but those are probably the four that I have to have is medium, Decoville, Peltex. Did I say another one or was that it? I don't remember. Maybe three then. <laughs> three. That's and that's I for bag making. Yes. That's for bag making. I typically go with something pretty lightweight and sheer for garment making. Yeah. Because... Yeah, I, I go with. I want with I want my either. fabric to have the support, but also not look stiff. For sure, mm -hmm. I would never use the medium that I use on clothing because yeah. even then, it just makes it makes things way bulkier. Mm -hmm. When I do it in bags, I'll I'll usually cut off the seam allowance so that it stays out of that you know it, out of the stitch lines because it just gets so thick but it just makes like beautiful card slots and yeah you know all those things right i love that you mentioned the seam allowance so that is something that i noticed with bag making is they would say like cut out this pattern piece in the leather or vinyl or whatever you're sewing it and then cut out a piece of stabilizer that's like a quarter inch less or, or, or you know around the edges because you don't want that bulky material to go all the way mm -hmm. especially if it's fusible you don't need it to go all the way into the seams yeah because then the seams get so thick they do you can't sew through them and so it's really a good call out that you made that um made that comment about usually with bag making your stabilizer is a little bit smaller than the pattern piece so that it's just inside that seam allowance area you mm -hmm. fuse it just inside and then you're stitching in just through the leather or the vinyl and not through that 
mm-hmm. stable the interfacing. I keep saying stabilizer, the interfacing. Yeah, and if I make a flap with my Peltex, I usually will sew it inside out, flip it, and then I'll cut my Peltex and just slide it in because it's just it's just easier and it'll stay there. And then you do a top stitch around; it mm-hmm. kind of secures your Peltex into place, so it's not going to move around. Um, yeah. And it's just, you don't want the edge of your project to be a little bit bulkier. You you can see that, you know, so mm-hmm. you really want to cut it out of. You want to get those crisp longer. seams. And it's yeah. really hard to when you have bulk like that. So mm-hmm. it's a good call out for sure. Um, all right. So we kind of mentioned the definition of stabilizers. Mm-hmm. I, I don't kinda think g- I have any. I'm not going to lie. Ah, uh, okay. So I, I kind of geek out over stabilizer. Um, so we talked about what it is. It's a temporary support. There's so many different types. So let me just kind of run through the different types of stabilizers there are. And, um, and then it, we can go from there. So there's a tearaway stabilizer. It just feels like a thick paper and it literally tears. Actually, well, I don't know if I have any right here. Um, there's a cutaway stabilizer, meaning it's it's thick like the tearaway, uh, like a, a thicker paper. But when you go to tear it, it doesn't tear. You actually have to use scissors to cut mm. it around. Uh, there's water-soluble stabilizer, which I am excited to talk to you about. There's an adhesive stabilizer. There's heat-away stabilizer and fusible stabilizer. Um, fusible stabilizer is pretty common, um, especially if it's like a you're using it on like a... There's a mesh mm. stabilizer that's fusible, and you would put that, like, if you had a, a stretchy T-shirt, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you were going to applique or embroider on that shirt. You would put the fusible mesh on the inside because it's really soft and malleable, and it allows the shirt to still be a shirt. But it's going to stay there afterwards. But you can lift it and trim it around just the design. But you're going to put a big piece there. And then after you put that on, you would use like a tearaway stabilizer or a cutaway stabilizer, something that's a little thicker behind that. So you're going to have double stabilizer on your knit. And then you can do your applique or your embroidery. But then the tearaway or the cutaway comes off. And then that mesh, you can lift it and just cut close around it. But it's going to prevent, you know how, um, with when you sew on knit it can kind of cause that pucker and stuff so if you Mm. ever get a shirt that's embroidered by a company like on the pocket and you get it home it looks great and then you wash it once and it's like like yes 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 looks awful because they use the right stabilizer isn't it it it, it doesn't necessarily shrink it just kind of caves in on itself you can't press it 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 just won't lay flat the whole pocket just looks like it was Mm. crumbled up it's because the company did not use a fusible mesh to give you the um, shirt stability because it's still knit at the end of the day. So if you just use a tearaway on knit, it's afterwards it's going to crumble up. But if you use that fusible mesh, it gives it consistent stability even after you've washed it. And, and it's going to allow the, the knit fabric to lay flat mm-hmm. continuously even after washing. Um, so there's a big difference. And you need to use both on knits. I know I kind of got off a tangent there. But yeah, so there's not a ton of like stabilizer types. Um, tear away, cut away, fusible mesh, and water soluble, I would say, are the four that I use the most. Um, I can say I probably never... Okay, well, the adhesive stabilizer is the, uh, probably the one I actually use the most. because, mm-hmm. But it's a tear away. It's a it's a sticky tearaway is what we call it. And so it's like got that plat like the shiny paper backing and you just peel it off like a sticker. And so it feels like tearaway on the front, but it's sticky on the back and you just stick it to your material and then it's not gonna move around. So the my personal favorite is a sticky tearaway or an adhesive tearaway stabilizer because that way it sticks to the back of material. If you're hooping it for embroidery or anything, it really and it doesn't leave a sticky residue when you tear it off, which is really nice. Um, but it's not going to shift on you. So I would say sticky tear away is probably my most commonly used stabilizer. Um, and my my most favorite stabilizer is water soluble. <laughs> I didn't even know. You know why. Huh? I don't know if I knew that was a thing. Yeah. So this is like where you can make, make magic happen, right? With 
with um, embroidery and making your own yes. materials. Right, those uh, ornaments that we uh -huh. for Christmas. Uh -huh. And the mm -hmm. hair bows, like you, okay, so there's called floating embroidery designs. So what you do is you take water soluble stabilizer and you put it in your embroidery hoop and you put it in your embroidery machine and you stitch out this floating embroidery design. It could be ornaments, like we mentioned, there's hair bow designs, there's lace, there's so many different things. And you can take these designs and like, after they're stitched out, because all that's in the hoop is the water soluble stabilizer. Mm -hmm. So you're only stitching through the stabilizer and it stitches the embroidery design out. When you're done, you take it out of your hoop. So you have the design in the middle of this water soluble stabilizer. You go to your sink um, or a bowl of water and you just dunk it. Right. And like room temperature water and it just all that stabilizer dissolves away and all that you're left with is the embroidery stitches mm -hmm. it's like magic um but you have to use special designs because they have to be closed looped and, and be secure when they're done and they no longer have stabilizer because they're not actually attached to any fabric right it's just stitches it's so cool um there's a hair bow design and it looks like lace and it makes this really pretty hair bow with the little tails and it yeah. and you embroider all the pieces and you water soluble it away and you're just with the pieces and then you just attack the pieces together to make the hair bow and would you put something on on it like to make it stiffer you could i mean if you're you could um use some you know starch or something if you really needed to okay. but it just depends on the d the density i guess is the right word of your embroidery design Mm -hmm. So you have something that's really light and delicate. You might have a really flowy lace and maybe that's what you want. But if you want it to have more stiffness to it, you mm -hmm. might have to use a starch on it or something for okay. sure. But Ooh. I think that really depends on the density of your design, your floating embroidery design. Um, another example of using water soluble <laughs> stabilizer was when I made my Barbie dress. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I knew what the stabilizer could do. And yeah. I thought, how can I use it differently? And so I had a big roll of it and I laid it out and I, the, the roll wasn't like big enough to be like the whole length of my dress. So I had to do strips of it, mm -hmm. but I needed the strips to stay together because it's not fusible. So right. that's when I got out my water soluble seam tape and I used water soluble seam tape oh. to basically attach the rows of water soluble stabilizer to each <laughs> other and i laid that out on my table and i placed all of my little fabric scrap pieces mm -hmm. um, down on top of a piece of mesh that was cut out in the shape of the pattern piece so i did have a piece of mesh as my pattern piece but it was like really thin mesh it's not enough to like be anything um but it was really just to give me the shape of my pattern because the end goal was for me to make my own fabric mm -hmm. and so i took all these little fabric scraps and laid them on top of the mesh on top of the water soluble stabilizer then once i had them all laid on top of that out in the pattern i wanted i took another layer of the stabilizer the water soluble stabilizer and did the same thing i basically sandwiched the mesh and fabric scraps between two layers of water soluble stabilizer mm. and i pinned the crap out of it <laughs> like so much so many pins and then i just went to my sewing machine and i just did straight line stitches in every direction a thousand times until there every every square inch mm -hmm. of that entire piece had been sewn so that none of those little scrap pieces would fall off because, and I just hoped and prayed that it was enough because once I got done with that, I trimmed off the excess water soluble. I trimmed around that mesh pattern shape. I did surge the edges mm. around the whole fabric piece just to give it some stability. And I threw it in the washer. And, and just hope that fingers. the last six hours of my life wasn't just going to go down the drain. So it was a little nerve wracking. But when I put it in the washer, I just did a gentle rinse cycle. There was no detergent or anything that wasn't necessary. And it was all clean material. Mm -hmm. um, and when it came out, all that was left 
was those fabric scraps sewn to- together on that mesh backing. Hmm. All the water soluble stabilizer was gone. Um, it it was exactly what I needed to do. And the reason that stabilizer is so important is if I had tried to just pin all of those pieces of scraps to that mesh, it would have not had the stability for me yeah. to be able to one sew through it, and and it looked good at all. Um, all of my pieces look so good. And then I had to repeat that entire process for the back piece of that dress. That's right. <laughs> it was, I think, 13 hours nonstop in one day. Hey. Ashley was along for that ride. I was messaging her and Diana like, what have I gotten myself into? But I have to say, it's one of my most creative pieces I've ever made. Mm-hmm. It's a one of the kind. You can't buy that fabric anywhere else because I made the fabric for that dress. Yeah, it's a good idea or even just like to take that idea and apply it to like making bags or just like, you know, you have a big bin of scraps. You can literally keep the tiniest scraps and put it into a little, you know, and it gives it a fun texture. Yeah. Like when I say like these, these, what now? It frays after washing and stuff too, right? Mine did not. Oh, but mine did not. if If you have woven fabrics, it will for sure. Mine is woven. Well, you obviously sewed a lot of freaking lines. <laughs> I sewed a lot of lines and I also yeah. use really good quality fabric as well. Like that doesn't fray very easily. Mm-hmm. Um, mine, mine washed several times. I didn't have any like major fraying or anything. Um, so, but I will say when you sew all these lines, the corners that aren't tacked down, yeah. Or what kind of pop out. So you do get that texture. It's really fun. I think it would be fun to do something like that and then like applique that onto a shirt so that you have like this like mm-hmm. maybe big heart. I just keep saying hearts, but you have this big heart that's really scrappy and yeah. you just kind of applique that onto the shirt after, but you made that material. Like you, 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 it's just so cool. But the other thing is like maybe you don't do scrappy pieces, maybe you do strips. And you weave them together, but you still need the stabilizer to hold them together while you stitch them together. So you mm-hmm. could make your own patchwork plaid stripes, you know, like you could really get creative. It. You can make your yeah. best too, right? Yeah. So I feel like water soluble stabilizer is an underrated missed opportunity when it comes to stabilizers. And it, if you have like any sort of like creative, artistic, and you like to play and have fun and just make things up as you go, like I do, mm-hmm. man, that stabilizer should be in your sewing room at all times because the sky's the limit with stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It really is. And what I did before I made that dress, just for fair warning, is I took a small piece with some scraps, I sewed it together, and I washed it off, and I tested it. Yeah. I tested it. I tested, do I sew straight lines? Do I sew zigzag cross lines? Do I sew, like, I tested different sew. Do I do free motion? I thought about doing, like, free motion sewing with mm-hmm. squigglies all over it. And I'm so glad I didn't do that. Um, Because it's we really could. hard to be consistent. And it would take forever. Yeah. But, um, yeah, do a little test swatch and decide, like, okay, do I like this look, this look, this is, did this work? Do I need to do more stitching? Yada, yada. And, and um, that made that made me feel like, OK, now I can just jump in and go give this a whirl. Um, Definitely would be a I great project for kids, too, because you just yes. no rhyme or reason and they don't have to do straight lines. And I mean, it's just so cool. I think it makes me want to do another one with um, like different types of denim mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and make like a scrappy denim bag or something. And then would, would, would probably fray him and give you that extra texture too. I think. But that's like so in, right? Like mm-hmm. it is. I just think it's so cute. Anyways, those are my favorite stabilizers. <laughs> Obviously, I really love the water soluble. <laughs> it's not something I use every day, but yeah, I feel like it unlocks my creative potential with fabric when I can use it to make my own fabric or mm-hmm. make my own floating embroidery designs. I mean, get some. Try try it out, play with it. There's a lady I follow on Instagram, and I cannot for the life of me right now think of her Instagram handle, but she uses water soluble stabilizer and does these really cool free motion embroideries. So she doesn't even have an embroidery machine. She just does a free motion embroidery, which everybody can do on their sewing machine. And um and so you don't even need an embroidery machine to use this, by the way. Mm-hmm. And she does free motion embroidery and she makes this stuff look like coral. Oh, yeah. It's like coral pieces. It looks very much like 
under the water kind of really cool artistic stuff and then when she's done she washes it away and she will stabilize it with starch right some sort of starch and she lets it dry and then she puts it on a foam board backing and she puts these pins these little straight pins in to hold it to the backing once mm -hmm. it's dry and stiff she pushes the backing away from the design so that the pins stand up and the design is now floating on top of that foam board and it's just floating up. It is art. Yeah. It is beautifully stitched art. It is, it creates this pretty shadow behind the stitch. It is so stunning. Well, we need to figure out that so we I can will. share it. I will. It pops up every now and then on my Instagram. And every time I scroll, I mean, I know how it works and I see it every time, but I stop and watch every single time and um it's it's beautiful so i will find it and i will be sure to share it because it is it is really cool and some of you probably already know who i'm talking about um but anyways if you do put it in the comments yeah <laughs> if there's any that we haven't mentioned because yeah. there probably is that's and we need to know them all so if there is then definitely go over to our youtube channel and leave a comment in the comment section we would love that I um I would say that we've covered a lot when yeah. it comes to interfacing and stabilizer. I know that we probably miss some of the common ones. If you have one that you really like to use, please share it with us. I know that there's so many different types, but I think the big thing is most of us prefer fusible when we can. Oh yeah, for sure. It just really or a sticky but... stabilizer where it's, it literally sticks to your material so it doesn't move because yeah. that's the thing is you don't want it to move. And the key is making sure you're using the right material. I think with interfacing, you, you can kind of make it a judgment call on preference of what the look you're trying to go for. But for stabilizer, you do need to be using the right stabilizer for your project. There's also I didn't even mention this. There's something called clear and melt. Hmm. And it's like a plastic sheet. Oh. And so when I, I have a tutorial on it um, over on Singer, uh, we did a project for a towel. So towel, you have to think Terry, so for stabilizers, the material that you're using also determines the stabilizer you need. So as I mentioned, the knit, you need like that two layers of the mesh yeah. and the tearaway. Mm -hmm. um, for a Terry cloth towel, there's two different stabilizers, but one goes on the bottom and one goes on the top. Oh, and that's yeah. So think of it this way: when you think of a terry cloth towel, it's got loops, yeah. right? And uh, and all wovens are, I mean, all knits are like loops, right? And um, but the terry cloth is like big loops. Mm -hmm. and we don't want when we're stitching really close together, like a satin stitch for applique or any sort of embroidery on a towel. We don't want our needle to get caught on one of those loops. Mm -hmm. uh, and when there are big loops like that, it can happen very easily. So you have your sticky or non-sticky tearaway stabilizer on the back of your of your towel, so the back side of your applique or your embroidery. But on the top, you're going to put this clear and melt um, hmm. plastic piece, and it's it's going to make a fun like punchy sound when you're doing it. But it goes over the um, top so that your needle doesn't get stuck in those loops. Okay. And then when you're done, it'll either melt away, wash away, tear away. There's different ones. Um, and then the back obviously tears away. So with terry cloth or any large loop material, maybe even like a large loop French terry, you would want to use that on both sides and uh, kind of sandwich the stabilizer on both sides of that material so that you're not getting caught and you're getting a beautiful stitch out embroidery or applique. So if you're not sure what material to your stabilizer to use with the material or the project you're doing, there's actually a really fun, um, really easy to follow blog and guide that I wrote for singer.com that's over on our website. Yeah. Um, so it's like a great tool to be able to decide this is what I, this is my project. This is the material, the stabilizer I need. So hmm. there you go. So if you need a resource for that, I already made it and it lives over there on Singer's website. Um, and if you can't find it, I'll try to link it in the description. Ashley, don't let me forget. I'll just link it in the description below. Um, yeah. I think we got pretty nerdy on this one, but I think, I hope it has helped you guys kind of understand, obviously, the difference between interfacing and stabilizer 
and when to use which. Yeah, I think you that feel like you've learned overwhelming, but um, I mean, I would just kind of start with one. Yeah. And then just learn it. Like, that's what I did. I just started with like medium weight, feasible interfacing mm -hmm. and then bring it home and then see what it does. You know, don't go out and buy all the things like this one like girl me? that I know. Oh, yeah. Huh? <laughs> I was like, this one girl that I know, she went about all the things. But yes, Bethany did that. Okay, well, let me explain myself if you're going to throw me under that bus. It's I was because... not saying. <laughs> well, I'll throw myself under it. Um, I am the type of person that when I get my mind set on a project I want to do, I want to already have everything I need to do it. Yeah. I don't want to have to stop yeah. and go to the store. Sure. Because then I'm not going to do it. And so when Joanne's, for example, has all their stabilizer and interfacing for 60% off, I'm going to get a little bit of some of the stuff that I know I want to use mm -hmm. in the near future or um, want to learn how to practice. Right? I did mm -hmm. ask you like, hey, out of these, which, so I, I did have you point me and say, okay, these are the ones I most commonly use. And so those are the ones I got. I didn't get some random one off that I'll never use. No, uh, the other thing I... I want to tell you is the the stabilizers they're all like all white but they come with like that piece of paper like that's folded up in it oh, don't me. but don't get rid of it or no. cut off a section of it that you need and like pin it to the material so you know what it is so it's identifiable because until you get really familiar with these you may not know yeah. what which from which and when a pattern says you should use a uh, Peltex or SF 101 or whatever the the brand, the version is, they recommend, you may already have it. But if you don't have it labeled, you're going to go, I don't know what that is. They're yeah. all white, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. mark them. Cut, if, if that paper that's wrapped up in it annoys you, just cut off the piece that has the information about that material and just pin it or tape it or staple mm -hmm. it to it or something. Yeah, because it's Perfect. a big roll, but it's like repeat of the same yeah. information. But yeah. just in case someone only buys like a half a yard, it has to be all there kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's important information. It tells you how to use it. It tells you what it is. Um, so it's you you need that as an identifier between all of it. And that's for interfacing. And then the stabilizers come in rolls typically. And the paper information is usually mm -hmm. on the outside. I stick it down in the middle of the roll. Mm. so I can pull it out and go, okay, yeah, that's what, it, but I mean, at this point, I know just by grabbing them and touching them, which one's which, but mm -hmm. sometimes I'll get like tear away and cut away confused, yeah. but you just take the corner and go, oh, that one doesn't tear. That must be cut away. It's right. You, you know, yeah. but for the most part, um, I, I keep the information down into the middle of the roll. So it's mm -hmm. always there. All right. Um, All right. Do you feel more confident about stabilizers now, Ashley? Mm-hmm. And um, interfacing, you were pretty pretty See, well versed it, on interfacing. When it comes to garments, I usually just use like lightweight interfacing. Yeah. So I like use a that light with my bags. I'll use it for garments. So I'm not going like, you know, I, it's it's not too complicated for me yet, yeah. at least. Yeah. I mean, mm. we can make it complicated, but there's no sense to. No. Again, there's no hard rule, I feel like, that says with interfacing that you have to use one specific thing for that specific project. Again, no. it's personal preference. So yeah. let's say let's say your bag that you're making, the pattern says to use something kind of lighter because the bag is being made in like a vinyl or a leather or something that's already pretty thick and substantial. But the, let's say you decide to make it out of quilting cotton and you want a quilted look, well, you're going to be using foam or something different. So again, there's a lot of variables there. And the more you learn and practice with these different interfacings and stabilizers, the more confident and comfortable you'll be able to make those calls and those judgment mm -hmm. calls based on what you're wanting to do. So well, I, I just, I just want to mention though, that like what they used to do though, before stabilizers and things is they would use different fabric. Like I mm -hmm. have used a heavy duty canvas or something like that to add stability to cotton fabric. Mm -hmm. Like there is, you can use other things. You don't have to use the, you know, Pellon, go to the store, mm -hmm. buy it. So just know that like, if you, you know, already have other fabric, maybe scrap, as long as it's the same color so that like you don't see it through the your main fabric yeah. yeah exactly then like you could totally just yeah. it, it would act the same way as a sew-in stabilizer 
mm-hmm. using a thicker material to back canvas it. or something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so that's what I very... did at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we jump into our sewing confession, mm-hmm. oh, what? I just want to say happy early birthday to Ashley. Oh. Right. <laughs> That's coming up. What, what, it what is. are you hearing? <sighs> so this this podcast is the, coming out on the 19th. So oh, I wanted yeah. to make sure that we said happy birthday before your birthday. I'm going to cry. <laughs> the big 4-0. Oh. oh, my God. <laughs> So I can weird. only say that because I turned the big 4-0 and later this year. So we're I'm right there with you, girl. But oh my God. just want to take a minute and say that we all love you and we wish you all the best. And 40 is the new 30. It is. It really is. <laughs> awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you. you. Ready to jump into the sewing confession? <laughs> yes. Okay. This week's sewing confession is a little spicy, so brace yourself. And don't forget, if you have a confession that you want to share, click the link in our description. They're uh, they're anonymous. Mm-hmm. We don't know who you are unless you tell us in the confession box, so don't. All right, so this week's sewing confession is, one night, my boyfriend and I experimented with satin fabric. We loved how soft it felt, but sadly the fabric caught on fire from a nearby candle. We freaked out and tried to put out the fire. We both had minor injuries and rushed to the emergency room. We learned a lesson that night. Satin melts. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's <laughs> plastic. Well, we're glad you're okay. You're able to send us this confession. That would have been really unfortunate. I hope there's no longer satin material fused to your skin. Yeah. And I hope it's not in, in sensitive places. But fabric, it can it can invoke things in us, just this, you know, beautiful textures and things. Mm-hmm. But you just got to, you know, use use the candles, the electronic ones. I think. Yeah, a battery <laughs> operated is probably the safe bet, but I don't think that was what they were going for. No, no, I know. <laughs> that was a good one. We love it. We love it to see it. And uh, we hope that um, nobody ever uses candles with satin fabric again. Let this be a lesson learned. Thank you for sharing that with us. And until next week, we love you all. Happy birthday, Ashley, and happy Bye. sewing. Bye.